Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Dean McKay says it's going to be a fun crowd, so we're going to have a fun night, OK? Does that sound good? All right, a lot of that. I want a lot of that. You know, uh, you mentioned the 2008 campaign, and um, I can't help but tell this story. So uh, before the February 5th primary, I was the political director for the state of Connecticut for the Obama campaign. And we were having one of these big rallies. So it became our strategy. Before a primary, we'd have a big rally. We'd get everybody fired up. We'd get them out on the streets the next day. And we'd win. That, be that became the, 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 the way that we operated. And so at this rally, we'd have a 20,000-person venue in Connecticut. And people had been waiting for hours, and the senator was running a little bit late. So finally, there was some energy in the room. The music started to play. That electricity started to fire. And I came from backstage uh, to go introduce him. So I came out, ran up the stairs, came to the podium, and 20,000 people were on their feet, just electric, very excited, cheering. And I said to myself, these people think I'm Barack Obama. <laughs> See, I had more hair then, and it was an easier mistake to make. And it's, it's actually how I earned the name Fobama. So, so I, I did what many of you would have done. I waved to the rafters on the right, and I waved to the rafters on the left. And, uh, it was a lot of fun. And who, who knew that picking someone with a funny name that was 30 points down in the polls uh, would pay off uh, then and continue to pay off now? And it's been one of my great joys to have served him uh, on the campaign and in the White House. But thank you for applauding knowing it was me. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I'll never forget you for that. But this is a big deal. Congratulations. It's an honor to be with you. It's an honor to be with the Brown School. Give yourselves a round of applause. I know you guys are very humble about that. It really is a big deal what you guys have accomplished. And uh, Dean McKay's already given you the opportunity to acknowledge your parents and loved ones, but let's acknowledge the faculty and staff that are on stage that have helped you along this journey. And we should also acknowledge Dean McKay in her first complete year as Dean. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. It means a great deal to be here. Uh, and as you mentioned, with the current sort of political climate, I myself wasn't entirely sure how I would be feeling today. I wasn't entirely sure what sort of message I would be delivering today. But I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. And I'm hopeful because of you. Um, and perhaps the appointment of a special prosecutor. But mostly, <laughs> mostly you. 80-20. Mostly, mostly you. But no, but seriously, over the last few weeks and, and a lot of time today, I've gotten to learn about your spirit and your programs and, and what you're about. Um, I learned about For the Sake of All, which is working to eliminate racial inequalities. Yeah. Yell it out. I learned about Homegrown St. Louis, which is designed to better serve and foster development in young black males here in the St. Louis region. And, the Center for Social Development. I learned about these programs, which are just a small example of the more than 50 organizations that you guys are touching, excuse me, the 500 organizations that you guys are touching here in St. Louis, and says nothing of the organizations and families that you're influencing around the globe. So your work and your spirit gives me hope. Traditionally, commencements celebrate the hard work and achievement of the graduates. Your long nights, your early mornings, last minute papers and presentations, examinations, your overcoming of it all. But to be honest, I'm here for more selfish reasons. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad you did all those things. But I'm actually here because the barriers to employment can be structural. Because Systematic racism can be a life sentence because health impacts more than just the doctor bill and because social equity, let alone mobility, is not guaranteed. Because we don't always need another report, sometimes we need people with the knowledge to turn that report into action. Because our world is increasingly focused on the individual rather than the common, 
on instant gratification rather than long-term outcomes because our policy is increasingly stovepiped and our communities are becoming more homogenous and disconnected. I fundamentally believe to continue to perfect the American experiment, then selfless people with the greater good in their heart and innovative ideas in their head must lead. I'm here selfishly because I want America to reach its promise. I need it to be more perfect for my community, for my family, for the ones I love, for the ones I've yet to meet. And to achieve that greatness, it needs people like you. People like you who have committed to putting the well-being of others at the center of your work. Now, Dean McKay mentioned home, and indeed, WashU is my, my academic home. But my, my home home is just outside of Washington, D.C. I grew up in the suburbs in a place called Gaithersburg, Maryland. Any Marylanders in the house? We have some Marylanders in the house. Perfect. Back in Maryland, uh, my mother's a teacher and my dad's a preacher. Now, don't say that to me that I'm going to go on for a long time, <laughs> though I may. I say it to let you know for where I come from, that though I don't have a, a social policy or health degree, being a teacher, preacher's kid means that I was baptized in love and raised in service. And watching my parents try and sow and foment community in their church, I feel like I knew, my sisters and I knew what intersectionality was before intersectionality was a thing. I was the kid that got dropped off at his grandmother's after school while my parents were at work. My grandmother volunteered at a local hospital, and so it was five-year-old Jason that tagged along with her. My job was to scoop ice, and I would watch her, and she would go into these hospital rooms that I wasn't all that keen on entering. Sometimes they smelled a little funny. Sometimes they were dark. Sometimes the patients wanted to pinch my all-too-chubby cheeks. What was amazing, though, is that my grandmother always knew what to do, whether it was to offer a daily devotional or to, you know, a steady hand or a listening ear or just to be a warm, silent body. She gave these gifts of dignity. And in watching her, I knew that that's how I wanted to spend my life, to use my life to influence others for the better. And with that spirit, I've had the joy of doing a few things. Dean McKay mentioned some of them. I've worked on local and national political campaigns and worked in political organizations, did some politics and a little policy, started a social venture, working on a documentary, started a nonprofit, for-profit, a for-profit that never made a profit. You know, these things come in <laughs> all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, I think a lot of people would accuse me of just not being able to keep a job, but the truth is, the truth is I realized a long time ago that we do ourselves a disservice when we try and put each other in a box. People would say, you're a lawyer, why are you trying to do a documentary? You're a community organizer, what do you know about business? You're a businessman, what do you know about policy? More than any of those individual titles, I've been most interested in empowering individuals and communities through whatever means are most effective. I've stopped asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because it's the wrong question. Instead, the question should be, what do you want to do? What type of person do you want to be? What sort of change will you bring? Focusing on the impact we want to have in this world transcends the strictures of a job, allows us to step off the proverbial treadmill, frees us from someone else's measure of success, and empowers us to create our own. I appreciate that woman. Get off that treadmill. <laughs> now let me let you in on an important secret. You're not perfect. Let me say it again. You're not perfect. I heard some, some sighs or some deep breaths. Despite what the people on the stage have told you over the last few years, no one expects you to be. But here's the kicker. 
that you have been endowed with all the ability, the knowledge, the power, the empathy, the passion, the hustle, and the skill necessary to do the work that you have been called. And I fundamentally believe that you have been called to do the work that you are preparing to do. And you have the unique opportunity, dare I say the responsibility, that despite your, our, gleaming imperfections to create something more perfect for others. That is what makes life worth living for me. Now, I warned you, I'm the son of a Methodist minister. Won't preach too long, but I'm reminded of a hymn just because of what I've heard from Dean McKay and the other faculty with which I had lunch today about you all. I know that in this room, for those of you that know that Methodist hymn, in this very room, is the next founder of a revolutionary startup. In this room is the next groundbreaking clinical researcher. It's the next leader of a team in the fight for mental health. It's the next administrator who will change the trajectory of a young man's life, like the late Dean James McLeod did for me. You see, I was a wayward sophomore here on the Danforth campus, when Dee McLeod thought it important to know me by my name and story, and made me feel like I belonged, that I was valued, that I was loved, and significant. You are all significant, and the work that you're called to do is significant. Now, this last election exposed some major divisions in our country major differences on the path forward. Policy issues like health care and immigration and education, all on the table. But perhaps more concerning were the deeper issues that were exposed. Issues like, how do we actually address one another? What should the American community look like? And what are we prepared to sacrifice to make it so? Where has the decorum in our politics gone? You see, it's, it's those questions that we should struggle over. And through that struggle, as history has shown us, is when new leaders and new opportunities to push our, company, our country forward will arise. My family's story is rooted in similar struggle. As I mentioned, I have a close relationship with my grandmother. I learned volunteerism and service from her. And a few years ago, she took ill. So I returned back to that same hospital where we used to volunteer, this time to visit her. Sit, provide a steady hand, warm body, and listen to her stories. She told me the story of a one-room schoolhouse in the community in which she grew up. It's a colored school. She started attending there in 1924, but it was built in 1868. Three years after the the scourge of slavery was eradicated from Maryland. Freed blacks decided it was a good idea to build a schoolhouse on the main road to educate the black population of Quince Orchard. Now, I couldn't understand how that was a good idea. The educating, sure, but I stopped here to say, why would they build this schoolhouse on the main drag? Surely there were safer, more thoughtful ways that this wouldn't be easily undercut. And my grandmother stopped me, and she said, <clears throat> Jason, the black kids in the community needed a school. There was no public education for black children at that time. Those men, one of which was my great-great-great-grandfather, she said those men looked around their community. They saw a need, and they were doers, and doers do. Doers do. Incredibly simple, but incredibly profound. And so I wear doers do on a bracelet to remind me that in a world where we often suffer paralysis by analysis, that sometimes the most important thing you can do is to do. Now I know in Brown school speak, doer, we can replace that with change maker. Because you guys have certainly been doing quite a bit but I think one of the most important takeaways from this election is that there's much more to do. 
and that you're the ones to do it. This is where your critical skills are necessary to innovate and disrupt where efficacious and completely supplant where otherwise necessary. Where a strong understanding of the underpinnings of the past will allow for systems change for the future. And where recognition that solution can just be in bringing two unlikely stakeholders together. In fact, I think you are obligated to be the ones to do it because in a world of questionable ethics, we must be led by the principled. And I know you'll let your core values of service, social justice, dignity, integrity, competence, and community lead your actions and dictate your outcomes. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't share at least one story from my days at the White House. So, let me do that now as I prepare to close. I remember my first day, uh, we had a staff meeting. And there aren't that many large conference rooms uh, in the White House. And so this staff meeting took place in the Situation Room. So if you've ever seen a picture or, or been there, you know that effectively the Situation Room, though very technologically savvy, is one big conference room. It's a conference room with a conference room table, chairs, around that conference room table, and then against the wall, another set of chairs. And so as staff entered the, the situation room, we took our seats, many of us taking those seats around the edge of the room, leaving some of those chairs open at the table. And the boss was running a few minutes late, and when he arrived, before taking his seat, he saw these empty seats around the table. He saw us comfortably sitting on the periphery and looked at us and said, what are you waiting for? Take your seat at the table. We've got work to do. And we realized that we were, in fact, the ones that we have been waiting for. So to the class of 2017, I will give you the same directive that he gave to us. Take your seat at the table. Take your seat at the boardroom table. Take your seat at the research institution, at the think tank, at the table in the hospital, at the mental health institution, at the nonprofit, at the classroom leading our next generation, that table in Congress or in a city council or at a state legislature, because I will shout it until I'm blue in the face that we need more of you running for office. Class of 2017, we need you to take your seat at the table. Your work gives me hope. In whichever seat that you temporarily fill, I ask that you deploy the lessons that you've learned here and make the world a better place because you did. You're well-educated, you're well-equipped, you're well-prepared, and now it's time to take your seat at the table because you're doers and we sure got a lot of work to do. Thank you so much.